Right, so I'm Mohammed. I'll continue with the branch protection. This is a very interesting question and easy, straightforward, but a bit tricky. So you have to be careful about every sentence here. So you are given a piece of code and it's basically an array of n elements and those elements or the value of those elements are truly random generated. So you cannot predict the value of those element at each index. And you have three F loops inside the for loop and at each uh, F statement you are trying to examine if that value is multiple of two, three or six. And this is not if else, this is very important. Okay, and the question asks you to um, show out of those four branches, so you have B1, which is the for loop, B2, B3, and B4, which are the if loops. So uh, out of those four branches, what are the locally uh, correlated uh, branches? Local correlations mean here uh, for the specific branch, if I know the previous value from the previous iteration or, or if I know that branch is taken or not taken, can I decide on the current iteration whether this uh, branch will be taken or not? So this is what does mean a local correlation. So basically for the first branch, uh, I have um, a for loop from zero to n minus one, which means this iteration will be uh, repeated n uh, times. So if I am in the um, n minus one iteration, so I know for sure the next iteration will be taken, right? Because I have n many uh, iteration for branch one. But for branch two, branch three, branch four, uh, are, uh, I'm trying to examine the value of the element. And the value it says here, it's completely random. So if I know that uh, the previous value or from the previous iteration for branch, uh, branch two was not taken, so I cannot decide, I cannot predict for the current iteration whether B2 will be taken or not. So that's why the locally correlated uh, branches are only B1. So for the second part of the question, um, the same thing, but I'm uh, asked here to find the globally correlated branches. Meaning that if I'm the current iteration and one of the branches is taken, can I decide, can I say something about the other branches? Can I say whether it will be taken or not? So for example, B2. So if the value at that index is multiple of two, can I say something about it, whether it's being multiple of three or multiple of six? So obviously if B4 was taken or it's currently taken at the current iteration, then for sure B2 and B3 should be taken. Any, any number that's multiple of six should be for sure multiple of two and three. So B4, B4 is globally correlated with P2 and B3. Any questions so far? So very easy. Just you need to remember the difference between locally correlated and globally correlated. I have a So yeah, so this is basically based on the compiler. So if the compiler decides that B1 is placed before B2 and then B3 and so on, so when it add PC equal PC plus four, then you go directly to the B4, then you need to predict the, the branch four, whether it's taken or not. It could be the other way around. Could This one could be placed before, right? So. Anyway, the, the thing here is that if branch two and three are taken, then for sure branch six should be taken, right? And the other way around, if B4 is taken, then B2 and three for sure should be taken, right? Because any value that's multiple of six, multiple of two and three as well. So straightforward. Okay, so now for the second part of the question, 
So this should be uh, B or two, and this is A. Okay. So now I want to run this piece of code in a processor that has a global branch uh, predictor. So I have, um, I'm given this a global history register that has two bit only. So you could have three, four, but here I'm, uh, I'm only having two bits. Two bits mean I have four entries. And for the global history register, what I'm storing here is basically if two branches are taken or not. So it could be taken, taken, not taken, taken, uh, taken, not taken, and not taken, not taken, right? So one of those entries. So I'm considering two branches at the same time. And the pattern history table, uh, I'm storing four entries as well. So for each one of those, it could direct me to, uh, to this um, pattern history table where I'm storing something here in each entry. So I'm having four entries in, uh, so this is the global history register, and this is the uh, pattern history table, and this is the entry. So I'm setting all those values here to zero initially. And whenever I'm facing or I'm hitting one of those entries in the global history register, so I'm trying to increment this by one. And if it is missed, then I'm decrementing it by zero. Or if it is taken, uh, I'm increment by one. If it is not taken, decrement by one. So this diagram is given the other page, which is here. <laughs> Okay, so yeah. So the question now, I'm, I'm doing this for loop 120 times, means, means that n is equal to 120. So, I'm, um, so the question asks me what's the value should be here in the first entry, given that, that uh, the first record is taken and taken. So there are two branches are taken, so what's the probability of the next uh, branch to be taken or not? Or in the other, in, in the, so let's rephrase it. So what will be the value of that branch, the third one taken, then I'm going to increment one. And if it is not taken, I'm going to decrement by one. So what's the final value after 120 iterations? Okay, so I'm having B1, B2, B3 and B4. Okay, so now let's assume B1 and B2 are taken. Okay, what will be the contribution of B3 being taken or not to the total value? So for this equation, because given here that all the values are completely or truly randomly generated, so I cannot guess any values. So for simplicity, I'm going to assume that the values are one, two, three, four, five, and six. So this is my uh, array. So the, any value at any element or any index can be one of those values, okay? Just for simplicity. Why select one to six? Because the, the, this piece of code is always examining the multiple of two, three, and six. So this range should cover all the possible values. After that, I'm repeating myself. So after six is six to 12 is the same thing as one to six, right? Okay, so remember that, maybe I could show it here. Yeah. So this is uh, B1 and B2. So uh, B1 is always all the, it could be any of those values, right? So six over six the probability of having all those values. So it could be any one of them. I'm not excluding any one of those. For B2, it should, if I take B2, means that the number is multiple of two. How many of those is multiple of two? Three values, right? Which are two, four, and six. And this has the probability of three out of six. Now, for B3 to be taken, means that one of those number or all of them or some of them is multiple of three as well. How many of those is multiple of three? Only this is guy, right? Okay, so which is multiply by, uh, by uh, one over three, which is six out of three values, right? Clear? 
Okay, great. Now, this is for the first case where B3 is taken. Given that, B1 and 2 is always taken, based on the entry here. So both of them are taken. Now, for B3 to be not taken, which is the other two values, so um, 3 out of 6 multiplied by uh, 2 out of 3. So this is taken, this is not taken for uh, B3. So now what's the total? Again, this is, it should be in plus, this is, should be in minus, because I'm decrementing whenever a branch is not taken. So do the math, uh, you will get, uh, yeah, minus 1 over 6. Any questions so far? Just add them together, that's it. Simple math, right? Okay, so now I'm considering the other, uh, the other possibility where I'm having branch two and three are taken, and I want to examine if B4, um, the contribution of B4, whether it's taken or not taken. So B2 and three, uh, it's multiple of two and multiple of three. So I want to check out of those uh, six values, how many of those are multiple of two and three in the same time? How many? Okay, so which is number six. So I'm having one out of six is both uh, for branch two and three to be taken. And now I'm, I'm checking the branch four, which is multiple of six. So we already said that I'm picking this guy, which is number of six. Now what's uh, the contribution of B4 to be taken? which is single value, which is six. So always six will be taken, right? So multiply by one, that gives me one out of six. Now, what if B4 is not taken? If B4 is not taken means that um, there's no other values. I'm having only one value. So that's why a minus zero, and I'm having one out of six. Now you can consider the same thing for B4 and B1, which are taken, and in this case, multiple of six is only one out of six. Now I'm uh, checking if branch two is taken. Branch two is taken mean I have only six, uh, the, the, the value six, so it's always multiple of two. That's why we multiply it by one, we get one out of six, and we have no decrement, uh, no decrement, uh, no, uh, no possibility for B2 to be not taken. So it always should be taken because any value is multiple six is multiple of two as well. And the same thing, so what's remaining now? I'm having um, B1 and B2. To both of them to be taken, B2 is multiple of two. How many of those are multiple of two is three out of six, multiply by, um, No, the first one was B1 and B2, and then uh, checking B3. So here I'm checking B1 and B2. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so first one was B1, B2, I'm checking B3. Now B2 and B3, I'm checking B4. Now B4 and B1, I'm checking B2. And what else? So it should be B2 and B3. And now I'm checking B4, right? Okay, now it makes sense. So B2 and B3 is multiple of two and three. Is we have only one value, which is one out of six. And now I'm checking B4, which is should be one, the single value, then I have one out of six. Now, one sixth, one sixth, one sixth is three sixths. Minus one out of six, this gives me two six, multiplied by the number of iteration, 120. So this is the, do the math, you get the value. Let's see. Okay, so, so yeah, so this, 
this problem deals with a, a couple of figures here. So figure one shows a systolic processing element, right? And so figure one, ugh. Okay, yeah, figure one is this guy here. And so this is one processing element. And we're told that each processing element takes in two inputs, which are N and M, and then it has two outputs, which are P and Q. And then every processing element also contains an accumulator called R, which is just like a data storage element. And this can be read to and read from and written to. And the initial value of the accumulator is zero, right? So figure two expands upon this and shows an array of these guys composed of nine elements. And figure two is this one. Uh, so yeah, so we have nine of these processing elements here. And then these are going to be input, input data tokens. So, okay. So we, we have that array of nine processing elements. And so we want to program this systolic array design to perform the following matrix multiplication. So we want the output C to be the matrix A times the matrix B, right? And so the matrix multiplication is, you know, just like row times uh, the dot product of like row times column and then row times column to produce all the output elements. And so we have a bunch of like design specifications here. And so in every single time cycle, every processing element, which is this guy down here, will take in the two inputs, perform a particular computation, and then write the outputs. And the time cycle labels on the input boxes determine which time cycle the inputs will be fed into the processing elements. And so that means that over here, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 mean like these, uh, these data elements will be sent in here on cycle 0, and these on cycle 1, and these on cycle 2, and so forth. And same with these, these inputs coming this way, right? So every processing element takes in those inputs. And so any processing input element that is not driven will default to zero. And any processing element that has no output arrow will also have its output ignored. So, so the output from these guys is just basically discarded. And any input that we don't actually specify is just going to be zero. OK. So after all the calculations are finished, each processing element's accumulator will hold one element of the final resultant matrix arranged in the correct order, right? So um, we want this output matrix, which is the nine elements of C, to basically be encoded in these guys. And um, we, we can assume that the correct order is basically the same order as the input. And if, uh, sorry, as the same order as stated here. And if we assume something else, then we should, we should just say so. So we're going to go ahead and assume the same order for this case. So we want C00 to be here, C01, C02, and so forth. OK, so yeah, we want that output at the end. So the question asks us, please describe the operations that every individual processing element performs using mathematical equations and the variables MN, P, Q, R, which are the input outputs and the register here. So they give us empty fields for what, what should P be, what should Q be, and what should R be as a function of the inputs and R. Right? And so the second part asks us, please fill in all 30 input boxes so that the systolic array computes the correct matrix multiplication result described in the previous page. And the hint says to you know, you write it in terms of A, I, J, and B, I, J. OK, so I'm going to leave the, the matrix up here. And then we have our, our, our diagram here. So it's okay, it almost fits. But yeah, so, so basically we want to arrange all these inputs of A and B into these input boxes such that this computation is performed correctly, right? So, so okay, so suppose that because we want the outputs to be like this, we will take a look at the first, the first output, C00. So we know C00 should be composed of the dot product of this first row times this first column, right? And so we want a00 times b00 plus a01 times b01 plus a02 times b20, right? So we somehow need to feed those inputs into this box. So these a and b are going to have to go either here or here and be fed into here one per cycle, right? And so for the next processing element, for example, c01, c01 is over here. And so we're going to want this series of a's, but then the next column. And so all the same a inputs need to go to this box and this box, and also, by the same logic, this box. So it would make sense to feed the A inputs this way, right? Because those are going to be used by all three of these processing elements. Uh, likewise, for the B processing elements, we're going to use them for C00, C10, and C20, right? Because 
for C, uh, C00, C10, and C20 will be the dot products of these rows times this particular column. So it would make sense to put them down here. So now it's a question of how we want to arrange the logic such that the output operation will be correct. <clears throat> so if we're passing the inputs um, from, bas basically the same inputs are being passed to each of these three processing elements, right? In, in any direction we really think about. And so the same input element that comes in here, which is M, is also going to be the, the output element, P. So, so these two are, are identical. You don't perform a transformation on the input for this particular output. And the same goes for N and Q. So if we're just passing the elements through, then when we come to our equations here, we're just saying P equals M, because it's just a pass through, and then Q equals N. And that's all that's going to happen. And then in order to perform the dot product, every cycle that we have two of these elements come in, we're going to have to perform element times element, and then accumulate the result. Right? Because So every cycle, we're going to get a new set of inputs. We're going to multiply them and add them to the accumulator. So what we really want is R equals the original R plus the inputs, the, the product of the inputs, M times N. So this is, these are the operations that the processing elements will perform individually, right? And so the last part of this question is to kind of figure out how to organize the data such that we, we get this computation performed correctly. So, okay, so we can think about this in terms of at what cycle the inputs will reach particular elements. So for this first element, in the initial, the, the very first cycle, we'll have data to compute with. So we want to put the first elements we can here. And so we can put elements here and here, and the cycle after, and the cycle after. And since there's only three we want to do, we can just leave nothing in the outer two cycles, right? So we can just have zero inputs here, because we don't need to do anything. For this guy, it'll receive an input on the very first cycle here, but it will take two cycles to receive an input here, right? So we don't want to put a data element here, because otherwise we'll just have one input and then nothing here. So instead, we're going to pass the input from the second cycle. That way, when this one reaches this processing element, this one will also reach this processing element, and we'll perform the correct product. So we're, we're going to have zero. And then by the same token here, it's going to take two cycles, uh, so like one, two, three, to get here. And so we want this data to also take three to get here. So we're going to have data here, meaning that these two will be zeros. And so by the same logic over here, uh, it's going to take two cycles to get here, so we want this data element to come in at the same time as this one. So we're going to put zero here and also here. So, so now we know we want to arrange our data basically in this fashion and then this fashion over here. And so we just have to add these inputs, right? So on the very first cycle, we can have this guy compute A00 and then B00. And then on the second one, we can have it do A01. And then over here, we can have it do B10. And then so forth. Sorry, can you, oh, is it off the edge? Oh, yeah, OK. So, so yeah, so at this point, we've, we're basically done with the problem. We're just filling in this table in terms of like what, at what cycle the inputs get here, right? So A00, A01, A02, and then here, B20. And then for this guy, he's going to be computing the the product of the first row, which comes in, uh, I guess I got A and B backwards. Yes. Very good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, OK. So I'm just going to write this again. So this is A00. This is A01. This is A02. And this is B00, B10, B20. OK, yeah. So this guy's going to take in the three A's afterwards. And we're going to require the second column of B's here. So this is going to be B01, B11, and B21, and then uh, so on and so forth. We just fill in the table, yeah? OK. So, so yeah, that's both parts of this question. And if you just fill in the rest of this. So uh, any, any, any questions about this one? I think it's m a lot more straightforward than some of the other ones. So yeah, OK, yeah, yeah. I guess we have a solution sheet. So there you go. <laughs> it's, it's, it's done. OK, uh, this question is about bet vector processing. So we assume a vector processor that implements the following ISA. You have uh, set uh, instructions to set the vector stride register and vector length register. You have loads uh, that loads uh, uh, from memory into a vector register. This takes 100 uh, cycles and is pipeline. Uh, uh, 100, 100 cycles per load. So if we have a vector length of 100, we will have 
100 uh, uh, latency per load, but they are pipelining. We can initialize one per cycle. The same for stores. We have uh, 100 latency pipeline. Uh, uh, multiply uh, 10 cycles, add five cycles, and divide uh, 20 cycles, all of them pipeline. So, you assume the following a processor has an in order pipeline. Uh, the size of a vector element is four bytes. Uh, uh, the size of the uh, vector style register and vector length register is 10 bits. The processor does not support chaining be between uh, vector functional units. The main memory has n banks. Uh, and vector elements are stored in consecutive uh, memory addresses. Uh, uh, vector uh, elements that store in consecutive memory addresses are interleaved between the memory banks. So if a vector element address A uh, maps to bank B, the next address, A, A plus 4, uh, address to uh, the next bank. Uh, and N, the number of banks is not necessarily a power of 2. So the memory is wide addressable. Uh, vector elements are stored in a four byte aligned manner. Each memory bank has 4K row buffer. I think this information is not required for this exercise. Uh, each memory bank has a single read and single write port so that a load and store operation can be performed sim simultaneously. And there are separate functional units for executing loads and stores. So, what should be the minimum? Uh, what should be the minimum value of n to avoid stalls while executing loads and stores, assuming a vector of strides of one. So the latency of uh, accessing one single bank is 100 cycles, so 100 cycles. And we can, uh, so uh, one bank will be occupied uh, for 100 cycles. So uh, if we pipeline these operations, we can access the next bank stride one, so this is bank zero, bank one, which this will take 100 cycles, and so on and so on. So we can access this bank again after 100 cycles. So to not stalling the, the loads, we need uh, 100 banks. So 100 banks, we access one of them each cycle. So in the cycle 100, uh, we will access the, the, the last bank. And in the next cycle, the first bank will be already done with the, with the first load. So with 100 banks, uh, uh, it's enough to stall any, uh, to avoid any stall in loads of stores. Notice that if you have, for example, a load, uh, a vector length uh, smaller than, than 100, we could have less banks as well without the stalling. But here is a, uh, his, uh, uh, his, uh, so we have to assume that uh, the vector length can be any length. So in the worst case, it's 10 bits, as we saw here. So it can be more than 1,000 uh, uh, vector length. So we have to assume uh, that in the worst case. So 100 is the correct answer. Uh, yeah. Yeah, they are two different memory banks. So it's specified here, right? Vector elements stored in consecutive memory addresses are interleaved between memory banks. Okay. So the next question is what should be the minimum value of, uh, of banks to avoid the stalls while executing uh, loads, uh, uh, loads or restores, assuming uh, a stride of two? So if we assume the stride of two, if this is bank zero, bank one, bank two. So if we uh, assume a, store, uh, a stride of two, the first access will be to bank one, the second access will be to bank two, and so on and so on. You have uh, 100 uh, banks as previously. The, the access number 50 will be accessing this bank that will be occupied because this takes 100 cycles, right? So 100 banks is not enough uh, for, high, for not stalling uh, the load uh, instructions. But if we have an extra, uh, an extra bank, 
you have 100 uh, and one banks. What will happen is that uh, is that is that uh, we access so in the in the second let's say in the second iteration we will instead of accessing this bank we will access this bank. So we will we will be filling the gaps uh, in the second uh, round, let's say, with 100 uh, and one banks. Yes. Can you repeat that? So, um, if we have to explain yes. why we say 101, can we also say the greatest common divisor of 101 and 2, the, like the number of banks and drive, is 1? Because, I mean, that's. The yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then full stop and that's okay. Yes. Okay. As far as a, a reasonable uh, answer yeah. is okay. So, uh, okay. Uh, next question is: uh, Assume a machine that has um, uh, memory as many rank as you found in part A, so uh, n is uh, 100. Um, the vector stride is 1. And the value of the vector length is set to m, but we don't know m. We don't know the vector length. So, and, and the machine executes this code. So, the total number of cycles needed to complete an execution is, is uh, this number. What is m? So, we can, uh, let's say, draw uh, this code. So, um, the first load, it will take uh, 100 plus n minus 1. Uh, it's clear why uh, why is this the latency? Have to explain this. This is because so if we have uh, uh, so if this is one, so we can uh, start one new uh, load uh, every cycle, right? So at the end we will have. We will have this 100 because this is the latency plus this latency. But this latency is the pre so if the total one is m, we have 100 for the last one, and then we have n minus one here cycles. We can start one uh, load every single cycle. So we have uh, so yeah, this is the latency for for the load. So the next load. Uh, we can start the next load uh, after the first load. It, it takes the same uh, latency. Um, then the add. So the add depends on uh, depends on B uh, one. So only it, it is independent of uh, of B two. So we can start. Uh, the add here, but uh, as we cannot start two instructions in the same cycle, we need to wait for one instruction here. So we, we will uh, we require one cycle here plus five cycles plus n minus one. Okay, um, next is the multiplication. Um, this depends on B2 and B3. Uh, this depends on the add um, in the load, so we can so and the last one to finish is the is the load, right? So we can start the multiplication here. Um, that is the multiplication is uh, ten cycles plus n minus one. And the last is the store that depends on B4. So we can start after after the multiplication. And the store is 
100 cycles plus n minus 1. So to know the latency, so we have the latency of uh, this part, so it's 100 plus n minus 1. So this latency is hidden because this is larger, so we have plus 100 plus n minus 1. Then we will go here, is plus 10 plus minus 1 plus 100 and minus plus and minus 1 equal to to this latency. And if you solve this equation, uh, yeah, m is 1000. Questions? Yes. Uh, both assumptions are reasonable, right? Okay. So, so again, yeah. More questions about this one? So, and the last one is uh, So if we modify the vector processor to support chaining. So now we support chaining. So uh, again, it's the same code, right? So we have the load first. We have 100 plus uh, n minus 1. So. Uh, and we have the second load. Um, second load is independent from the uh, previous one, but uh, we have only one load uh, executing unit. So we have 100 plus n minus 1. Um, we have the add. And the add. Uh, where is the add? So the add um, depends on B1. Depends on this. Um, so because the processor is in order, so we can only uh, start the add after, after this load. So we can start again one cycle after this load. So we have five um, and minus one. Um, the next instruction is the multiplication. Um, the multiplication depends on B2 and B3. So B2. So depends on the add and uh, depends on these two instructions. Um, but we can uh, start, uh, because we have chaining now, we can start executing once uh, we have the first element of, 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 the vect of the two vectors available, right? This is at this point. So when we load, we have the first element of the load after 100 cycles here. So we will have this before. So at this point, we have already available the first element of, of, of the vector. So we can start the, mul uh, the multiplication here because now we have chaining. Um, so we can start the multiplication here that is uh, 10 cycles plus n minus 1. Um, the store. 
the store depends on V4, that is the multiplication, the result on the multiplication. So we can start the store after the first element of the, multi of the vector multiplication is, is calculated. So we can start the store here. This will be 100 cycles plus n minus one. So and, and if we uh, formulate this equation, uh, we have so n m is the m is the value from the previous uh, ex, uh, previous question. So m is one thousand. So we have the latency here is uh, so this one plus plus this one one hundred plus 10 plus n minus one. Oh no, sorry. Plus 10 plus 100 plus n minus one equal to number of cycles. And if we substitute n for 1000, uh, the result should be, should be, should be this. Two thousand. Yeah. Any questions? So um, this this uh, is uh, like typical question in which uh, you have to calculate what's the Cindy. Utilization. Remember that the SIMD uh, utilization, not only in GPUs but also in vector processors, mean like uh, the um, uh, ratio of lanes that you are actually using. So uh, here, um, the first thing that you have is the definition. SIMD utilization of a program run on a GPU uh, uh, is, is defined as the fraction of SIMD lanes that are kept bit busy with active threads. Uh, when are we going to have active threads? Well, we're, we're going to have active threads when we actually execute some instructions for these threads. Uh, the question gives us some piece of code, and this is essentially a for loop, as you can see. And it says that this is going to be executed on a GPU. So the way that this is going to be executed on the GPU is distributing the iterations of this loop across the uh, threads that we have in warps. So here we have n uh, iterations, and these n iterations are going to be executed by a certain number of warps. That's the first question, that's part A. How many warps uh, does it take to execute this program? Please leave the answer in terms of n. So we have n iterations, we know that the warp size is 32, a warp in the GPU consists of 32 lanes, and we also have, uh, so, th sorry, th 32 threads, and we also have 32 CIMD lanes in the GPU. So uh, n divided by 32 is the number of warps, because, uh, so in case that n is not divisible by 32, we have to use the ceiling of this division, right? Maybe the last warp is not completely busy, but uh, we, will, we will steal this, this number of warps. Part B says, assume integer arrays A, uh, so we have A and B. A has a repetitive pattern with 24 ones, so it will be something like this, 24 ones, followed by eight zeros. And B uh, have a different repetitive patterns, uh, which have 48 zeros followed by 64 ones. Uh, what's the CMD utilization of this program? So observe that this is the repetitive pattern of A. And A 
the values of A determine if the body of this if statement is executed or not. Uh, as you already know, this if statement will be converted in some, into some kind of uh, um, 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 comparison and some kind of branch, right? Because in case that you don't need to uh, execute this body, you will have to uh, uh, branch uh, in order to avoid uh, this um, uh, uh, loop body. So that's why, um, uh, depending on what's the exact value that each of the 32 threads of the warps of the warp read, um, we will execute the, bo the body of this uh, if statement or not. And observe that here the condition is that uh, A is divisible by three. Uh, because all these 24 ones that we have here are not divisible by three. Uh, uh, only those threads that read A I equal zero will actually execute this statement here. <coughs> so if we have two instructions, instruction one and instruction two, the first instruction for sure is executed by 32 threads, but the second is in each warp, right? But the second instruction, instruction two, is only executed by those threads for which a modulo three is equal zero. That is, for these eight threads that read these eight zeros here. So, out of 32 plus 32, that would be the maximum number of threads that we have executed in this instruction one, and then instruction two, uh, threads that belong to the same war. Uh, the uh, CMD utilization in this case is 32 plus eight divided by 32 plus 32. So this is uh, 40 divided by 64. So that's the answer to this part B. Uh, second part says, is it possible for this program to yield uh, seem the utilization of 100%? Well, and the answer is yes. But this, this uh, um, case in which the seem the utilization is 100% is going to be um, dependent on the value of each of the elements of register uh, of array A as you already know. There are two possibilities here if we want to have 100% SIMD utilization. The first possibility is that all threads in each warp execute instruction one and then they go into the body of the if statement and they execute instruction two. That's one possibility. The other possibility is that the threads in the warp all the threads in the warp execute instruction one, but they don't execute instruction two because this if condition is not true for any of them. So the answer in this part, if yes, what should be true about our race A for seeing the utilization to be 100%, uh, the answer here is two possibilities. Every 32 elements is divisible by three or every 32 elements uh, uh, isn't divisible by three. So either way we will have all threads in the warp executing both instructions or only executing one of the instructions. Uh, we are going to stop here because we run out of time the rest of the exercise is very similar. You already know how you have to reason about this exercise. Uh, here, there is a question, uh, part D, 
and E uh, are very similar questions, but uh, the, the, the percentage, the SIMD utilization is different. You, you can reason in, the, in a similar way. And the very last part is, is actually uh, quite easy. This is uh, what we explained in the GPU, the first GPU lecture about dynamic warp, warp formation. You might remember that there, we, there might be a way of, let's say, merging warps like this, where some threads are active, uh, other threads are not, not active, and if these threads that are active uh, are not, in different warps, are not in the same lane, they can be merged, and this way we can have more efficiency in, in our execution. We stop here. Thank you. Question says, uh, we define the SIMD utilization of a program that runs on a GPU as a fraction of SIMD lanes that are kept busy with active threads during the run of, a program, of the program. As we saw in lecture and practice exercises, uh, the SIMD utilization of a program is computed across the complete run of the program. The following code segment is run on a GPU. Each thread executes a single iteration of the shown loop. Assume that the data values of the arrays A and B are already in vector registers, so there are no load and stores in this program. Hint, notice that there are three instructions in each iteration. They are clearly marked here in the code. Um, a warp uh, in the GPU consists of 32 threads and there are 32 SIMD lanes in the GPU. So we have warps of uh, 32 threads, that's the warp size in this case, and the total number of iterations that we have is 1,025. So the way that we need to calculate the number of warps is by uh, obtaining the ceiling of the division uh, 1,025 divided by 32, and this will give us 33, 33 warps, okay? The only important thing to keep in mind here in this uh, part of the, of the exercise and also in the, in the rest of the ex exercise is that uh, warp number uh, 32, assuming that we start uh, numbering the warps from warp zero, in warp number 32, there is only one single thread uh, active. That's important uh, for the rest of the, of the exercise. For example, here in part B, it says, uh, what's the maximum possible SIMD utilization of this program? Hint, the warp scheduler does not issue instructions when no threads are active. This is... Uh, something that we discussed uh, when we studied uh, SIMD processors. We talk about, um, what was that? The um, um, density time implementation, I think what's the, what was the, was the name. When we, when we somehow do a scan operation in, uh, through, throughout the mask to make sure that there are at least some uh, threads active before we actually issue the instruction. So in this case, we, the scheduler checks if there, is, uh, if there is an active thread. There is no, if there is no active threads, then the instruction is not issued. So in this case, uh, how can we get the maximum possible SIMD utilization? Maximum possible SIMD utilization will be the case where uh, all threads in a warp go through the same path. So uh, notice that the first instruction here, instruction number one, which is this uh, if statement, is going to be executed by all the 1,025 uh, warps. Uh, threads, uh, right? So there is no uh, possible divergence there. We are going to have, let's say, 100% utilization for this instruction always. But then uh, there is a possibility that the threads within the same warp diverge, and part of the threads go and execute instruction two, and another part of the threads go and execute instruction three. This is not the case that we want to consider, right? The case that we want to consider is where there is no divergence. In this case, we will have maximum utilization. 
So the way that, or the maximum uh, utilization that we can actually have in this program is going to be 1,025 divided 1,056. Why is that? Because we only have 1,025 threads active out of 1,056 uh, threads that exist in 33 warps. So it's impossible to have 100% utilization in this program for the sim single uh, reason that uh, we, th the last warp is not complete. So that's why uh, we get this number. And now the question is, what should be true uh, in um, this uh, array A for this maximum utilization to happen? That's what part C asks, uh, please describe what needs to be true about array A to reach the maximum possible CIMD utilization ask in part B. And it says, please cover all cases in your answer. Observe that uh, the, whatever the answer is, we will have to give the answer at warp granularity. Why is that? Because the instructions are issued at warp granular granularity. So divergence is only a problem within a warp. There is no let's say divergence, uh, there's no problem in terms of utilization if the threads of one warp go and execute instruction two and threads of other warp go and execute instruction uh, three. So the right answer here is for every 32 threads, they all will go and execute um, uh, instruction two or instruction three. So which means for, for every 32 threads, consecutive 32 threads, we will have 32 consecutive values of A, which are lower than 33 or greater or equal to 33. That's the answer, and that's what uh, needs to be true for this array A in order to have uh, maximum utilization in this program. Is that clear? If you, if you know, no, 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 that, that might not be correct. So if uh, you have found that in some uh, question in the optional homework, please uh, put the question in Moodle and, and we will look at it. Uh, maybe in some of the case, cases what you might have seen is that um, instead of 32 is 64, because in some cases we say uh, that the warp size is, 60, is 64, but this is just the way it's defined in the, in the beginning of the exercise. The, the entire array, um, that's, that might be wrong, but uh, just to make sure, please uh, put the, the question in Moodle. Okay, uh, next thing is, uh, uh, next part is part D. What's the minimum possible CMD utilization of this program? So, how can we, uh, how can we uh, obtain the minimum possible utilization of this program? Well, uh, we already know that this uh, instruction one is always going to be executed by all threads, so we are always going to have 100% or 1,025 divided 1,056 utilization for this instruction. And then what we need is that within each warp, we have divergence, so some of the threads of the warp will execute instruction two, while others will execute instruction three. And let's say, I don't know, the number actually can, uh, might change from warp to warp, but, but let's assume, because actually this doesn't affect the answer, that in every warp, alpha threads execute instruction two, and the rest, 32 minus alpha, go 
and execute instruction three. So by taking this into account, the way that we can calculate the SIMD utilization is by going instruction by instruction and warp by warp and thinking what is happening there. For the first instruction, we already know that 1,025 threads will execute instruction one out of 1,056. And then we have instruction two, and we know that alpha threads in each warp will execute it. We have uh, 32 complete warps. I'm talking only about the complete warps. We will talk about the last warp with one single thread active at the end. And this is out of 1,024, which is 32 times 32. And then instruction three is executed by 32 minus alpha times 32 threads, and we divide by 1,024. And then we have the last warp. We don't care if this last thread executes instruction two or instruction three. The result is not going to change, uh, but it's only one thread every 32. Uh, threads that belong to the same uh, warp. So uh, this, as you can calculate yourself, will be 1,025 divided by 1,568. And that's the minimum SIMD utilization in this program. The next Part, part E asks, uh, please describe what needs to be true about array A to reach the minimum possible SIMD utilization ask in part D. So what we need to make sure is that there is divergence within each warp. So what uh, we need for every 32 consecutive elements of A we need part of them be um, lower than 32 and the other part be, so, sorry, I said 32 is 33, and the other part be uh, greater or equal uh, to 33, okay? for every 32 consecutive elements, such that we make sure that we have divergence within each warp. And then for the last part, F, what's the SIMD utilization of this program? A program where uh, AI is equal to I. Again, for instruction one, no matter what's the uh, what are the characteristics or, or what's true for array uh, A. Uh, for instruction one, we will always have 1,025 divided 1,056. And then we have that instruction two is executed by 33 threads. Why is that? Because this condition here, the if statement, is only going to be true for threads with a thread ID lower than 33. So there are 33 threads that will execute instruction two. And notice that this is the entire warp zero composed by 32 threads plus one thread in warp one. And then the rest of threads will execute um, I, I3, including the thread in the last warp. So we calculate in the same way as we did before, 1,025, 1,056, plus 32, plus one. This 32 corresponds to warp zero. This one corresponds to the first thread of warp one divided 32 plus 32. And then we have 
960 threads that go all and execute instruction three, 960. And then we have the last warp with one single thread out of 32. And this will give us 1,025 divided 1,072. Go ahead. Yes. And in your lecture you gave, you discussed that um, there are dynamic warps uh, forming. So in this case, they would be merged to one warp. Yes. And then, um, well, that's assuming that there is dynamic warp forming. There's this, 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 uh, this doesn't hold here. Uh, we uh, because so this is somehow it, and actually the way it was explained was like an optimization possible optimization for warp scheduling on GPUs. Uh, if this is not something that real GPUs implement by default, and um, actually I don't know about any GPU that implements that, a real GPU, and um, uh, if uh, we, you know, decide to I mean, it would be possible that we have an, an, a question like that, but we would explicitly state that case. No, you shouldn't. You shouldn't make that assumption unless it's uh, clearly stated in the question. Um, so for the so the, the reasons are, I think it's the second exercise of this type that I solved here, in this this year, and uh, I didn't consider that um, in 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 any of both cases. And actually, if you read the questions that we have in the optional homework, that uh, that dynamic bar, warp formation uh, is is not there. I think yeah, maybe in in some. Exam we uh, some time ago we we asked something like that, but it was clearly stated. Now consider that there is dynamic war formation. So you, you would say for us in our exam uh, you should use dynamic war. Yes. So by default, as I said, dynamic war formation doesn't exist. So you shouldn't consider it. I mean, if you if someone has the question in the exam, it's uh, the one thing that you can always ask. But uh, okay. yeah, I, hope that it's clear because, yeah. I mean, it should be clear from now on, right? <laughs> Well, I mean, you are 400 students, you know, <laughs> and we are only 68, so <laughs> the, the variability of assumptions is, is uh, larger in your case than in your case, and these things can, uh, might happen, but that's why it's good to ask. Anyway, about the multi-cycle matching, I can, the only thing that I can tell you is that uh, multi-cycle matching the way that is explained in this course is never pipeline. Okay, but yeah, feel free, feel free to ask everything that is not clear. And maybe one recommendation is, is also before starting to solve one question, read it completely. Because maybe, I mean, you, you, you see how the questions are uh, written, right? Maybe they are very long in the beginning, but then, you know, the different parts... It's, uh, it's very short. So if you read the beginning, then you're not going to spend more than a few more minutes to read everything. Okay, and then if I do any assumption, I will just change it. Mm-hmm, okay. Uh, if we didn't get dynamic warps, that means we didn't have to worry about them not using the same CPU because then we couldn't merge the warp? Yeah, so that, that would be, I mean, if, uh, if we tell you 
Uh, now assume dynamic wire formation in the way it was explained in the lecture, then you will need to uh, worry about uh, the fact that they are in the same lane or not. But maybe another possibility could be lanes can migrate. <laughs> but in principle, don't worry about that. Anything else? Okay, thank you. Let's go. Um, it says we define the SIMD utilization of a program run on a GPU as a fraction of SIMD lanes that are kept busy with active threads during the run of a program. The following code segment is run on a GPU. Each thread executes a single iteration of the shown loop. Assume that the data values of the arrays A, B, and C are already in vector registers, so you don't need to worry about uh, memory accesses. And um, it gives us uh, one hint. There are six instructions in each thread. I will tell you now how to count these six instructions. A warp in the GPU consists of 64 threads where there are 64 SIMD lanes in the GPU. And there are 64 SIMD lanes in the GPU. So the six instructions are this is the first one, this if. Then we have uh, three instructions inside the first if statement. Then fifth instruction is second if, and this is the sixth. Right? Why don't we have to worry about the for loop? Because in the end, the for loop, what is uh, simply uh, expressing is the number of threads that we need to use. This is like the sequential code that we are going to parallelize using the multiple threads that the GPU provides, right? And what the question also says is that uh, each of the iterations is going to be assigned to one individual thread. So we already know what's the total number of threads that we need to execute this program, right? It's uh, 4,096, okay? And this uh, takes us to the first question, part A. How many warps does it take to execute this program? How many warps do we need to execute this program? So the number of warps is the number of threads, which is exactly the same as the number of iterations, divided by the size of the warp, which is 64. And this is 64 warps. This is the number of warps that we need to execute the, uh, this program, the number of warps of 32 threads each. Because in this particular architecture, the warp has 32, uh, 60, sorry, 64 threads. Uh, in another uh, different uh, problem, you can find 32, but in the end, there, was, there won't be uh, any difference. Okay, so these are 10 points for free, as you can see. Second part is more interesting. It says, when we measure the SIMD utilization of this program with one input set, we find that it is 134 over uh, 320. What can you say about the arrays A, B, and C? Be precise, look at the if branch. So look at the if branch means you have to analyze your code and see what's the influence that the different arrays have on, on the execution of this program and the utilization of this program. And as you can see, the only uh, important uh, thing to, to, to keep in mind with respect to that is are the um, if statements, right? And in the if statements, the only thing that we have is bi. So actually, a and c don't have any effect or any influence on what's going to be the actual path of execution. So simply, we can say, what can we say? We can say nothing about A, and we can say nothing about C. But about B, we can say many things, right? And why is that? Because depending on what's the particular value of B, each thread will go through this if statement or this if or none of them. Why is that? Because there are three possible values that are uh, important in, uh, for BI. Uh, 8888, which is we don't execute anything, none of the, uh, of the two paths, or uh, greater than or uh, less than, right? So these are the 
three possibilities that we have for the values of B. But now the thing is, how do we reason about uh, what's the actual utilization, which here is uh, 134 divided by 320. So what I would recommend you, and let me use this uh, as a scratch pad, what I would recommend you is that you uh, first start looking at what's the total number of instructions that the program has. And we know that the program has six instructions, right? How can we calculate the utilization, let's say, in a uh, generic way uh, when we have six instructions? So what we know for sure is that these six instructions uh, are going to be executed potentially, maybe not, but they are going to, obviously, depending on what's a, the actual path of execution, but they are going to be executed by 64 warps of 64 threads. And there are some instructions, as you can see here, that are always executed by every thread. In particular, this one and this one. Why is that? Because we have to evaluate the if statement. Right? So this is something that I can already include in the numerator. I know that all the threads of all the warps are going to execute the first, this is the first if, and the second if. Okay? And what about the other instructions? The other instructions are these three and this one. We don't know that, right? We don't know how many threads are actually executing these three instructions, but it is likely that not all the threads inside the same warp execute the same instructions, right? So let's assume that there is a number of threads, x, in each warp, that executes these three instructions. And there is also a number of threads, y, um, in every warp that executes that sixth uh, instruction. This is y, it's not four, to make sure. Okay? And what the question says is that this is equal to 134 divided by 320. And now we have to think a little bit about the numbers that we have on the paper. If you look at this, so if you look at this uh, expression here, we can get rid of all these 64, right? That's super easy. That's clear. And now if we look at the denominator, we will see that this is equal to 384. And 384 is not equal to 320, right? Actually, 320 is equal to 5 times 64, which means that in this particular case, only five instructions are executed by any thread. If we go back to our code, the only possible way that this happens, only five instructions, is that no one executes this instruction. And this way we will have this one for sure, this one for sure, and these three. How many threads? I don't know that. But I know that this number is x. Oh, sorry. Okay? The number of threads that execute these uh, three. So what I need to do here is to somehow rewrite um, this uh, expression for only five instructions. Uh, this is 64 times 3 plus 64 times 64 divided by 5, 64 times 64. And again, I get rid of this 64, and this is equal to this. And from here, you will find that x is equal to. Okay? So, right answer here is that uh, 2 
every 64 elements of B are less than that. Does it make sense? You can check yourself. Uh, there is no other possible answer in this particular question. When we, uh, when we prepare these kind of questions, we usually try that there is only one uh, single uh, possible answer. I'm pretty sure that you can come with uh, other numbers that can uh, take you to different combinations of X and Y, but this doesn't happen in this, uh, in this uh, case. So what, uh, as, a, as a general recommendation, what you have to do is to look at the numbers that you have in front of you and, and reason in, in that way, because the numbers are usually pretty simple. Uh, it shouldn't be difficult for you to uh, reason in this way. Okay. Okay, part C. Is it possible for this program to yield a SIMD utilization of 100%? And the answer is yes. And why is that? Because we, uh, so what it says, what should be true about A, B, and C for this to happen? Uh, again, we don't care about A and C, we care about B, same as in the, in the previous part. And if you want to have 100% uh, utilization, essentially what you need is that all the 64 threads of a warp which go uh, through the uh, same path, I mean, all the 64 threads of a warp always go through the same path. And for that, there are uh, three possibilities, indeed. And the three possibilities are that the that every 64 elements of B are equal to 8,888 or are greater or are uh, lower than, right? Every 64 elements. So maybe the first 64 elements are equal to 8,888 and the next 64 are uh, greater and the, and the next 64, 64 are lower. Is that clear? Okay. Every 64 elements will be equal or this or that. Okay, and then last part, part D, here it is. What is the lowest SIMD utilization that this program can yield? And this is actually very um, uh, easy to answer. Of course, you would need to calculate the, the number, but uh, it's uh, very related to, to what, uh, what, what we already discussed uh, in, in Part B, right? Because in the end, in Part B, discovered that there were uh, two threads in every warp that are executing um, the same uh, path, right? And, um, and this means that you have two threads. So if you want to decrease the utilization instead of two, use one, right? And so this, uh, this way, uh, the, the, I mean, the way to, to achieve the lowest utilization is to have one single thread going through this path and one single thread going through this path. And, um, and here you could calculate uh, something like, so and the, the way to calculate the actual number would be 6 times 64 times 64. And here, 1 times 64 times 3, which is the number of instructions in the first if, and then 64 times 64 plus 1 times 64 times 1, which is the number of instructions in the um, uh, in the in the second if, right? And the value that you will find here is 132 divided by 384, right? Uh, you also need to explain, but you know the explanation, right? Is one thread uh, is greater, one thread is lower, and the rest are equal, right? But do not forget to explain what you're doing and why are you... Uh, reach into some particular result. Any question? So for this question, we were given uh, basically uh, access pattern, the addresses, 
so which are basically in white fashion. So, and the question asks for us, like, we need to come up with the cache design given, given those uh, access patterns. So in the, so here actually, let me explain it first. So basically these are the accesses. Uh, so these are the ad addresses accessed uh, from Aldous to Young, and then we, we are given with the hit rates as well. And also these are the sequences of these accesses. But the important thing is that there are no other address accesses between each sequence. Basically these are back to back. So this, these are the things that we need to know. And for, for the first question, basically, uh, we need to figure out for the, for the cache block size. So for this one, actually, we can try to do brute force, and then we can uh, try each of the options here. So, is, so let's first assume that we have a block size of 128. So if that was the case, then for the first sequence, for, zero will be always a miss, right? So this is always a miss, so this is our first miss. But if, if it is 1, 2, and 8, the 4, 8, 16, and 64 will be a hit because this, this will be located in the same block as in 0. So we have basically here 4 hits, but whereas in the first sequence the question says we have 3 hits because we have 6 accesses and the hit rate is uh, 1 divided by 2. So this won't work. So let's try 64. For this one, again, 0 is a miss. And again, 4, 8, 16 and will be a hit. 64 and uh, 128 will be misses. So this kind of works. OK. So let's try 32 again. So 0 again, miss. So 4, 8, 16 again, hit, hit. And the rest, again, are misses. So, so this also works, kind of, for now. And for the, for the last option, we have 8 and 16. But for these, uh, see that, OK, we'll, 0 will be, again, miss for both of these. And, uh, but for, for both of these, actually, we won't be able to include 16. So basically, we will end up with the, at most two hits. And this is not going to work as well, at most two hits. So OK, so we are in between 32 and 64. We need to look at for the second sequence in order to say that, OK, this is the, this is the case size. So for this one, basically, the hit rate is uh, 5 divided by 8. And so we need to first look at the those addresses because we basically are sure that those won't be in the same block when they are first accessed. Uh, so for the 8K, this will be a miss. Sequence, sequence. For the first 8K, this is a miss. Uh, for the first 16K, this is also a miss. And uh, for this one, Ah, for this one as well, this is also a miss, for sure. So these are all misses. So, But again, then the rest of these need to be a hit for us. Okay. So in order this to be happen, to happen basically, our case size need to be 64. Why? If this was uh, 32, then basically 63 will, would be a miss because we don't basically access an address between 32 to 64. So in order this to happen, basically our case size need, need to be 64 so that we will also have this 63 as a hit, all right? So, okay, then 31 and 63 will be hit for us, but here also 64 need to be a hit, but our case size is 64. But the thing is that, so you need to get this, basically. We previously access 64, so this is already in the cache. So this is also a hit as well, okay? So our cache size is basically then 64 bytes, all right? So the second part of the question, 
So this is basically we are asked to find out the cache associativity. So we're going to do the same. Basically, we're going to try all of these, like one associative, two associative. So for this one, actually, we need to consider the, 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 the total cache size. Okay, it's either, it's either four, is either four kilobase pairs or eight, right? So for this one, if this is uh, one associative uh, cache, then the, for the for the four kilobyte cache, all the multiples of four K address accesses will be uh, will will basically try to access to the index of zero, right? And for the 8K, again, it will try to access to the index of zero if, if the cache size is uh, eight kilobyte. So we, we need to keep this in mind first, and then uh, let's assume that this is one way associative. And basically, write down all the accesses here, Let's write down all the accesses that are multiples of 4K. Okay. So these are basically four, uh, four uh, zero. I'm sorry, uh, 8K, 16K, 4K, 8K, and uh, 16K. All right. So if this was one uh, associative, so for each axis, we would be replacing the index, basically, index block, right? So, but, but, uh, uh, but remember that, I'm gonna show it here. So those things, these axes, need to be a hit in order to have five hits, basically, right? So it cannot be one way. So because those will be removed if it is one way, right? So basically, uh, when I access 8K, it will be replaced with this one, and 16K replaced with this one, 4K. And again, when I access the 8K, I will basically, it, I will be, this will be basically a miss. And then I will basically replace 4K and then put the 8K. So let's imagine four, two way. Then the ways are either the ways are either uh, two kilobytes or four kilobytes, right? So basically, I'm going to consider uh, all the accesses of all the multiples of two kilobytes here. Again, I'm going to do the same thing that I did here. So the multiples are basically the same. Zero, 8K, 16K, um, 4K, 8K, 16, I think I need to write more, 32K, and uh, 8K, I guess, yeah. Oh, right. Uh, oops. Yeah this, was, yeah, this was one. So this is actually, the explanation is kind of similar to the one that I did here. So for the actual, for the four way, actually, you can also consider 63 here. 63 will be a miss as well, because I'm going to replace zero with 8K, and then 63 will be a miss, and then this will, again, reduce the number of hits here. So for the four way, two way, it's kind of similar. Again, these are the excesses, and uh, for two-way, actually, I will have this one and this one for the first two access, and then I'm going to replace 16 for either of these, and then again replace 4K for either of these. So this will make us, like, for sure, 8 uh, or 0 will be gone, basically. Actually, both of them, right? So, uh, so when I try to access 8 here, so this won't be in the cache. So this will be a miss again. All right. So two way doesn't work as well. And one one way also doesn't work. So let's look at eight way. So I'm gonna write all the so for eight way, then the the size of each way is basically either five 
112 or 1K, depending on the case size, but basically we don't know it yet. So each way is 512 or 1K, then given this, I'm gonna basically write again all the excesses that are multiples of uh, 512. So these are, again, 16K, 4K, 8K, 16K, uh, oh, the 2K, uh, 1K, eight K. So basically, what I did was, so I picked all the excesses in order, in order zero, um, 8K, 16K, 4K, 8K again, 16, 32. 1K, and this is also a multiple of uh, 1024 uh, and also 8K. So these are the excesses that will map to the same index in this order. So if this was a, a eight way, then this would be in cache. Again, this would be, so this is again in cache. So this is already in cache. This is already in cache. So this will be again, that there's a space to put it in the cache as well. So there is also still a space to put this 1K address access into a cache, and, and, and also there's a space to put uh, 3K uh, into the cache again, because this is a eight-way associative cache, and all of these actually have the same index, basically. So what does it mean? It means that, so if you consider the sequence three, so the, our hit rate is uh, one divided by three. So, then this means that I only have two hits. So let's first find out the first hit that is for sure will be a hit, which is 129. Why? Basically, the, the reason is I already access 128 here, right? So when I try to access 129 here, so this will be for sure a hit, okay? So then, we, we don't, we, we shouldn't, so the, the options are basically either of these, just one of these should be a hit, not, not multiple of these, all right? But see if this is a eight-way associative case, uh, 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 cache, basically I will end up with having 8K as a hit because this is already in the cache previously, all right? So again, eight way won't work for us. So then four way is our only option left for this one. So the case size. <clears throat> so we know that this is a four way and block is 64 bytes and we are asking if the cache, uh, cache size is either uh, four or eight kilobytes. So, uh, so here then the ways are either 1K or the, the 2K of size, right? The size of the ways are either 1K or 2K, given that cache is either, uh, the cache size is, is either 8K or 4K again. So, um, then what we need to do is basically, we need to consider the, the actually all of the sequences, but we're gonna focus on the third sequence. So let's, yeah, let's again write down all the sequences, the, the, the addresses that will map to the index zero, which are basically the multiples of either 1K or 2K. Uh, so those are, will be, again, so we are doing kind of the same thing again and again. Uh, this is zero, and this is 8K, 16K, um, 4K, 8K, 16, um, 2K, 
So here comes the trick, basically. So 1K and 3K are will map to the same index if the way the size of the way is 1K. Basically, if the case size is 4 kilobytes. So this is only possible if if the case size is 4 kilobytes. Okay. So this won't be possible if the case size is 8 kilobytes. So because it won't map to the index zero. And for for 8K again, it will map to the index zero. So okay, we know that this is four way. Then this will be in cache. This will be put in cache. And then this one, this one, and this one. All right. So um, yeah, the 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 all the ways for the index zero uh, are full in the cache. Uh, so 8K again, it's in the cache. 16K, it's in the cache. So 32K. So for the 32K, actually, we're going to, uh, I forgot to write down zero here. There's also zero there after, after 32K, there's a zero. So even if uh, the, the, the replacement policy is FIFO or LRU, uh, in, in either of the case, we're going to replace zero for this one, right? So for the 32K is not in cache, and then those are in cache. And then I accessed uh, 8, 16 recently, and also 4K recently. So basically, this is the least uh, recently used, and also this is the also first one that put in the cache. Basically, I'm going to replace this. So this won't be in the cache, and 32, 32 uh, will be in the cache. So for 0, again, this is not in the cache, basically. Uh, so. So what we know is that zero is for sure a miss, okay? Because remember, we were saying that the number of hits are two, and 129 is a hit, and then is either zero or 8K will be a hit for us, and then we now figured out that zero is also missed. And then 8K, so this one uh, have to be a, basically a hit. So this will be crucial for us in this question. Uh, so why is the case? Because uh, if the case size is four kilobyte, basically this is not in the cache and this also maps to the index of zero. So basically, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna basically remove um, this one or or this one. So either of these, if this is FIFO or LRU, the, the, the either of one will be removed. So 1K will be put. And for the 3K, again, um, I'm, uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to replace uh, either uh, 4K, again, because this will be the least recently used. Uh, if it is not 16, let me see. We access 8K, 16K. 32, and this one, yes. So 4K, either 4K will be removed or or 16K will be removed. So basically what this says is that if the cache policy, the replacement policy is uh, FIFO or LRU, basically eight, this eight, address of eight will be removed along the way. Okay, this won't be in the cache. So why this is important? So if the case size is four, uh, four kilobyte, and this means that we will, we will have to replace the address of eight, 8K, and then this will mean that the 8K here will be a miss. So this shouldn't be a miss. Why? We are already given with the hit rate, and our only option is 8K should be a hit. And then this means that case size should be a eight kilobytes so that those one won't map to the index of zero in the caches, okay? Not index of zero. So that I will be able to access 8, 8K. So this is, this looks a bit tricky, to me at least. Um, so the last question. So we know that the case size, and the case size is, okay, so we know that the case size is eight, eight kilobyte. It's four-way associative, and the block size is sixty-four bytes. All right, I yeah, I got I got through, I guess yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, let's do the same for the one last time. So I'm again writing all the address accesses that will map to the index of zero in a sequence. 8K, 16K, 32K, zero, um, and, eight, and 8K. And this is four-way, right? So those are all in the cache. And, and if it is, uh, yeah, this is 8K, this is in the cache. But if it is LRU, then this is the uh, this is the one that is recently used. So 8K in the cache, 16K in the cache. 32 is not in the cache. So basically, I'm going to replace zero for the reason that I just discussed in the previous question. So zero will be replaced. 32 in the cache. Uh, so for the zero, so if it is FIFO, then we will have to remove eight. Again, but for the same reason that I described here, eight should be a hit, then this shouldn't be a FIFO. This should be, the replacement policy should be least recently used, so that I won't remove 8K instead, uh, instead I will remove 4K, because this is the least recently used, okay? And then, and then this will be a hit. All right, then the, then the policy is, I love you. All right. This was mostly uh, uh, oral explanation rather than writing all everything here, mathematically. But I hope that was clear. Yeah. Okay. So we have a question about tracing the cache. So we spent a little bit of time looking at caches, and so this goes over some like uh, some of the more fundamental concepts of caching, right? So. In this problem, we're saying that we have three types of CPUs. We have the 6808 D, T, and F, okay? And all three of these CPUs feature one level of caching. So the system looks sort of like we have a CPU here, and then we have an interface to a cache, and then the cache interfaces with memory. And so each one of these CPUs has a different type of cache, right? And so the, we're given that the cache size is 128 bytes, and the cache block size is 32 bytes. So that tells us that precisely four, bl uh, four blocks fit in one of the caches, right? And we also know that the cache uses the least recently used replacement policy. So uh, the only difference between these three caches is the associativity. So we're given that D uses a direct mapped cache, T uses a two-way associative cache, and F uses a fully associative cache. So if we go ahead and draw these out, then we're saying that D is a direct mapped cache, so every single uh, block it gets its own set. Right? So we have four different sets in the cache, and there's only one way. Number, uh, the design T uses a two-way set associative cache. So we know that there's two sets and two ways, because there's precisely four blocks in this cache. And then cache F has a fully associative cache, so there's only one set which contains all four blocks. All right, so when, when each of these caches store a block, in D, it's mapped directly to only one set. With T, it's mapped to one of these sets, but it could go in either way. And with F, all blocks are going to be mapped to this one set, but they could occupy any of these ways. All right, so we have these three caches. So then we're told that we run this particular program to evaluate the CPUs. And this benchmark tests only memory read performance by just issuing a series of reads to the caches. And so we're going to assume that the caches are empty before we run the program. Okay? So the cache accesses that are generated by the program are as follows in order of access from left to right. So we have a sequence of accesses to a bunch of different blocks. So this is, these are accesses to the cache by the program. So they're, what, they're what's going on on this bus. So every single letter here represents a unique cache block. And all eight blocks are guaranteed to be contiguous in memory. However, the ordering of the letters does not necessarily correspond to the ordering of the blocks. So it's, it's a mystery for us to solve. We don't know how these fit together. And for, then we're given that for the D cache, the direct map cache, we observe the following sequence of cache misses in order of generation. And so the cache misses are when the CPU requests from the cache, but the data does not exist in the cache. And so the cache has to go out to memory to get the data. So the misses are what's going on on this bus. 
And so by using these above traces, we want to figure out which cache blocks map to the same set for the 6808D processor. And so we can say a couple of things right off the bat. So we have eight cache blocks that are contiguous in memory, but we only have four locations in the direct map cache. And so by looking at some of the bits in the address, these, these cache blocks will be mapped into precisely one of these four sets, right? So given eight fitting into four, we're going to have two cache blocks mapping to each set. And so we're basically looking for pairs of cache blocks that belong to each set. So we have the sequence of axes and we have the sequence of misses, so we can begin taking a look at how to go through this. So let's, let's, um, let's draw out an empty cache here. So this is what our cache is going to look like at the beginning of the program with nothing in it, and these represent the four different sets. So at the beginning of execution, we have this sequence of accesses, which starts with A, and we have this sequence of misses. And so, so, a, so when the program first requests A, it doesn't exist in the cache, and so we generate a miss, which makes sense because it, it wasn't in the cache previously. And we don't know where it belongs in which order, but we know that it's going to be in one of the sets, so we just assign it a location. So this A generated this miss. Then we have B, and B also generates a miss because it hasn't been seen in the cache yet. But we, we don't know where it goes because it could be in the same set as A or it could be in a different set. So we're going to leave it alone for now. Then the program requests A again. And A appears to generate a miss. And so this means that A was kicked out of the cache when B was brought in because B has been the only thing in between. And so that, that tells us that A and B have to belong to the same set because when B was brought in, A was kicked out, and then A comes back in, and A generates another miss. So this sequence of misses comes from these guys. Then we bring in H, and H generates a miss because it's not in the cache yet, and so we can arbitrarily assign that a location. Note that you can't put H here, right, because we already said that there can only be two cache blocks per set, because these blocks are contiguous in memory. So then we bring in B, and B appears to generate a miss, which makes sense because A was the last thing that was brought in. Then we bring in G, and G generates a miss, which again makes sense because it's not in the cache, but it's the same problem, we don't know where to put it, so we're going to leave it alone for now. Then we bring in H. Oh, sorry, we don't bring in H, but we, like, we try and access H. And H does not generate a miss. So that means H is already in the cache, and when we brought in G, it did not kick out H. So G has to belong to a different cache set. Otherwise, H would have been kicked out and it would have generated another miss. So G is responsible for this. H and H are both already in the cache, so they're just hits in the cache. Then we bring in A, and A generates a miss, which is true because B was, <clears throat> B, B was brought in previously to kick it out. So then we have E, and so E generates a miss because we haven't seen it, but we don't know where it belongs. Then we call H, uh, we, we, tr we try and access H, and H does not generate a miss. The next miss is actually D. So H is still in the cache. So we know that E must go either here or here, but we're not sure which yet. Then we access D, and D generates the miss. So, so yeah, D, D has not been seen in the cache, so we're, we're not really sure where it goes either. Um, H, H is the next access, and it generates a miss. So we know something kicked out H. But the thing that kicked out H could not have been E, because we've already shown that E cannot belong, e cannot belong to the same set. So that means that this, miss, this uh, cache miss from D had to have kicked out H. Otherwise, H would not have needed bringing back in. So D has to be there. Then we, we try and access G, but G does not generate a miss. And so that automatically tells us that G is still in the cache, and so E has to belong here. Okay? And so G is a hit. Then we have C, and C, generates, C does generate a miss. And so C has previously not been seen in the cache, so we, we also don't know where it goes. Then we have another access to C, which is a hit, because it's already there. And then we bring in G, and we see that G is a miss. So G has been evicted in the past, and the only thing it could have been evicted by is C. So G has to belong with C. And finally, the only thing that we have left is F. So at this point, we know which, which addresses, which, which cache blocks belong to the same set, right? And so this is our solution. So we can say A and B belong together, H and D belong together, G and then C, and then E and F. Right, so we've, we've solved part A at this point. Are there questions about this part before we like, move on to the next one? Okay, so part B asks us to write down the sequence of cache misses for the F processor in order of generation. 
And so F is our fully associative processor, and uh, sorry, our fully associative cache. And so we know that in the fully associative cache, every single one of these cache blocks will map to just the only set there is, but it can occupy any of these positions. And we are also told that the cache uses an LRU replacement policy, right? So we know which ones get evicted when this when an eviction occurs. So uh, can I get like another paper? Okay. So we're going to go ahead and trace out these uh, cache misses in their order of generation, right? And so we're basically just going to enumerate how all this happens. So we're going to draw a sort of uh, just a model of what this what's currently in the cache. And so we have one we have one set which contains four different ways, and we know the sequence of accesses that occur because it's given to us. And so we're just going to go ahead and go through one by one and simulate what's happening in the cache as we go. So if we, I'm just going to transcribe this sequence really quick. So we have, just copying this down. Yeah, so that's probably enough to get going. So this is the sequence of program accesses. And so we can just begin simulating this cache. So the first A is, gets brought into the cache, and so it's a miss. So I'm going to denote that by putting an X underneath it. B gets brought in. It's also a miss because it doesn't exist in the cache, but we put it in a different way because there's free space. So that's a miss. A is a hit in the cache because it already exists here. So that's fine. H is new, so we put it here and mark it as a miss. B is already in the cache, so that's fine. G is not in the cache, so we bring it in and it's a miss. H is already in the cache, already in the cache, already in the cache. So this is a more interesting one. So we have E, which is not in the cache right now. So it's going to be a miss, but we have to figure out where in this cache, like what gets evicted in the cache. And so this is where the replacement policy comes in. So least recently used means we're looking for the, access, the, the cache line that hasn't been accessed, right? The, the, the oldest cache line, essentially. And so we can basically look backwards to see what's the oldest one that's currently in the cache. And since everything is kept in the cache up until now, we, we look at A, which, so, so A is in the cache, H, G, these three are all in the cache and they've been recently accessed. And the least recently accessed one ends up being B because it's the farthest. And so B gets evicted and instead we put in E. So E is now in the cache. Then we have an access to H, which is a hit. And then we have D, which is not in the cache. So again, we have to choose something to evict. And based on the LRU policy, it's going to be not H, not E, not A, but G. So G gets evicted and we replace it with D. And so that's a miss. Then H is still in the cache. G is no longer in the cache because we just evicted it. So now we have to pick what to evict next. So the least recently used, again, not H, not D, not E, but A. So A gets evicted, and we replace it with G. And G is a miss. C, so, so yeah, basically you just repeat this process for the, the whole set, uh, for, the, for the whole set of accesses that we have. And you write these down in order here. And that, that's basically the solution for part B. Should I actually go through it all? Like, do, does anyone want me to actually go through it? Or shall I move on to the next part? No? OK. Yeah, so it's just a process of like, manually simulating what's happening. <clears throat> OK. So the next part says that for the T cache, and remember that the T is the two-way associative cache, um, we observe the following five cache misses in order of generation, A, B, H, G, and E. But unfortunately, our evaluation setup breaks before we can observe all the cache misses that occur. So using just the given information, which cache blocks are in the same set for this processor? So now we have very little information to go off of, but we have to reconstruct what's in this cache. So we, we actually have some information from the previous part as well, too. Because, so we know that these, we know these pairings already map to the same, uh, to the same cache sets for, for, the, for the direct mapped for the direct map cache. So A, B, H, D, G, C, and E, F. And what this tells us is that since these, are, since these eight are guaranteed to be contiguous in memory, we know that for the two-way associative, uh, the, the two associative cache, if A and B conflict here, that means they have a spacing of four, four addresses between them. And here, uh, they'll also conflict in the same set because by, by being four away, they're also they're also going to be mapped to the same set in the two, it, with, with two sets here. So A and B will belong to the same set. H and D will be the same set, G, C, and E, F. 
So the same pattern is here. So we can use that information in combination with these five cache misses that were given to figure out which ones map to the same set. So I'm going to draw an empty two-way set associative cache here. And we can go through and do the same process and figure out what's going on. So <clears throat> over here, let's see. Should I write this down again? I don't know. Do you think it's necessary? So we have our sequence, which is A, B, A, H, B, G, G, H, A, B, H, D, G, C, C, G. Okay. So, and, and so forth that maybe we'll need more later. But so, okay, so we observed these cache misses. So we're basically going through this process of simulating this cache again. And so we, um, so A. So the first, the first program request is A. And so A is going to be brought into one of these sets. And so we just assume the first one. So, so A, A happens. Then B. And we, ordinarily we wouldn't really know which set B should go to. But because of the information from uh, part A of this problem, we, we know that B should go to the same set. So B will be mapped in here, since we're a two-way set associative. Then we have an access to A again, which is going to be a hit. Then we have H. So we don't actually know what, where H is going. And so we, we have to look at the misses that we get. So, so H is a miss because it hasn't been seen before. Um, then we have B. And so B does not generate a miss. And so that means B was not evicted. But B was also not the LRU here. A was the LRU. No, no, no. Okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah. B, B is the LRU. And so B, yeah, B would have been evicted by H if it mapped to the same set. But it wasn't because B did not generate an additional miss there. That tells us that H maps over here. And by default, we also get that D maps over here. So, so okay, so that misses H. Then B is a hit because it's still in the cache. G comes in and G generates a miss. So... Um, G, we, we're, we're not sure where it goes. H and H are still hits, so that's fine. So G could still be here, and it also could have evicted the LRU, which in this case the LRU is B. So then we have an access to A. And so A does not generate a miss, which, which is fine, because the LRU is B, and A is still in the cache. Yeah? Yeah. So then we bring in E, and E generates a miss. So E also gets mapped to one of these that we're not really sure which one. But we note that G and E come from different, uh, different pairings. Then we have H, which H is already in the cache. <clears throat> this is, oh, yeah, I think I missed something here. So, yeah, B. That means G. Yeah, G, G is required to be here because A did not generate an additional miss before, before E, yes. So G is guaranteed to be here. And so that means C is also here. And H is paired with D, so D, is, D also maps to the set. And then the only pairing left is E and F, which have to go here. So that, yeah, that basically gives us our, our different sets here. So we know the cache blocks that map to these sets are then A... E, B, F, and then H, D, G, C. Okay. Yeah, so let's, let's go through this again. This, <laughs> this one's a little in interesting. So I'm going to do the same thing we did before, where I'm going to write this down here, and we're going to trace the misses. So we have A, B, H, G, E, which are a sequence of misses. Okay, so, so we start off with an empty cache. So... Oh, we bring in A, A is a miss. We bring in B, B is a miss. And we know those go here. Then A is a hit because it's here. And A is now the LRU, right? So we've got to keep track of that. Then H comes in, and H generates a miss. So H gets brought in, but we're not exactly sure what H gets brought into. However, B is the LRU at this point, And B, so the next access to B does not generate a miss. Right? That means B is still in the cache. And B would have been evicted if H was mapped to this set, right? Because B is the LRU. So that guarantees that H has to be down here, right? And so we know that from, from these, these pairings up here, this gives us more information that we know D is in this one too, right? So after that, B is a hit because B is still here, and now A is the LRU, right? 
So I'm just going to write that down. A is the LRE right now. And then we have G. G generates a miss. We're, we're not exactly sure where G comes in. So G could be an either still. So G. Then we have an access to H. And H does not generate an additional miss. Right? So H is still in the cache. So H and H are hits. So these two are hits. Then we have A. And A does not generate a miss. Right? Because the next miss is E. So we know that A is still in the cache, which means that anything new that had been brought in had been brought into the other set. So what we've seen now is that G. So we know that G has to be here, because otherwise it would have evicted A. And then the next miss we see is E. So this gives us A, B, H, and G, which is basically enough information to put everything together at this point. So A and B are here. H goes with D. So H and D are here. G goes with C, so H, G, D, C are all in the bottom one. And then the only ones left are E and F, which have to be up here, because, again, like these eight blocks are contiguous, right? So, so that's how we get these results, A, E, B, F, H, D, G, C. Yeah? All right, was that, was that clear to everybody? It's a little more confusing than the first part, so it like, takes more thought. But, yeah. Why D belongs to H and G? Because so, so okay. So, so if we look at like what the addresses actually are, right? Let's say that three, four, five, six. So, so we know that A, B, C, D, E, F, G, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All, all those letters fit into this eight contiguous memory segments, right? So the the eight contiguous memory locations. So, like we can just think about this being like I'll give an example, I guess. So we can just think about. Sorry. Oh. Yeah, yeah, okay, but, but it's it's all about like, you know, A and B would have to be off off by four, right? In order to map to the same set over here. Because you're using specific bits of the address, right? So it's like modulo four. And here, this is modulo two, which anything that's modulo four, it's going to fit into here. And they're going to map to the same set here as well. And so yeah, it's pretty important that the eight are contiguous, because if they weren't, then you have no way of really knowing anything. <laughs> Okay, so the, the next part of this question asks you to write down the sequence of cache misses for the T processor in order of generation. So we essentially follow the exact same prescription that we did here, where we go ahead and simulate the cache, except this time we're simulating the T cache, given that we know which one's mapped to which set. So should I, should I do this or should I skip it? Because it's, it's, it's literally the exact same thing. You, you, just, you just go one by one and track whether it's a hit or miss, and then you just simulate the state of the cache. Yeah. Okay. So I, I'm gonna I'm gonna skip that. So, so does anybody actually want me to go through it? Like, just raise your hand or something, because I yeah. Okay. Okay. So I'll, I'll skip that one. So then, the last part of this question asks you what is the cache miss rate for each processor? So they're asking us for D, T, and F. And so we've we've already done all this work actually. So if if we go ahead and look at this sequence right here, we know exactly how many hits and how many misses we get, and they give it to us for the direct mapped cache, so we don't have to do that. Uh, we now know it for the fully associative cache, and we would have just done it for the two-way cache. And so we have all that information. So we literally just count up how many, how many misses we have divided by how many, totally, how many total program accesses there are. And it, it just gives you a number. Right? And so that would be the cache miss rate. OK. Yeah, so that's the end of this question. Then, so um, yeah, do, do you guys have any questions, or should I move on to the next one? So question two is uh, cash performance analysis. In this uh, question, what we do is uh, uh, do some, some micro benchmarking. This means that we are going to execute a specific uh, program, short program, that is going to exercise some particular features of the, of the cache hierarchy. It's uh, very interesting. This kind of uh, micro benchmark is very useful because uh, it usually allows us to do some reverse engineering in systems that we don't know how exactly they are built. And after uh, getting this knowledge, we might be able to uh, optimize our code, for example, better. So um, as you can see, uh, for this micro benchmarking, we are given two codes, code one and code two. 
uh, and we are going to access in these codes to uh, one array data that contains uh, four byte elements. So it's 32 bit unsigned integers. Uh, just uh, there is a note here that says, uh, in order for you to know, don't care about that, that this uh, latency array, the accesses to this latency array where we are going to store the latency of each uh, memory access uh, is uh, is not cache. So it, uh, the, the, this access is bypass uh, all the caches. And uh, timer, as uh, the question says, it's going to return a timestamp. So if we go through uh, code A, we'll, we will see that we go through the uh, uh, array data with a certain stride. And um, we uh, uh, record the uh, timestamp in the right before the memory access and right after the memory access, and then this way we calculate the latency. In the code number two, we have two loops. The first loop uh, is similar to the uh, to the uh, to code one. Actually, both uh, loops are the same. The only thing that changes is the size that we are accessing. Here is size one, and here is size two with the stride one or with the stride two. As, as you can see, is uh, in this loop two where we are going to measure the number of cycles that we need. As the question says, uh, the cache hierarchy has two levels. So it, we will have our CPU, L1, L2, and main memory. And we also know that the size of this L1 is four kilobyte. Uh, part A uh, says that we run code one and we obtain this chart that you can see uh, you can see in the screen. So uh, in this chart, uh, what we uh, can read is the latency of every memory access for 64 memory accesses. Uh, keep in mind that this memory axis, the stride in this memory axis is, is one. So the stride is equal to one. What's ha what happens here? The, 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 this part of the question asks about the cache block sizes in L1 and L2. So what happens here? Uh, we should infer what's hap what happens uh, from the latency values that we see in the chart. As you can see in the chart, uh, there are three different latency values, uh, 700, 300, and 100 cycles. So these uh, give us uh, an idea of which uh, part of the memory hierarchy is being accessed. Obviously, L1 is closer to the CPU than L2, and L2 is closer than, uh, than the main memory. So it is expected that this uh, uh, lower latency, 100 latency, uh, 100 cycles corresponds to L1, the 300 cycles correspond to L2, and the 700 cycles correspond to the main memory. Um, and actually, exactly what, we ha what happens here in the first, the very first access, uh, when I is equal zero, uh, we will have an L2 cache miss, for example, this cache block in memory will be brought to L2 and also to L1. Uh, and because we have an L2 cache means, that's why we see this uh, latency of 700 cycles. Keep in mind that the next access uh, is with a stride equal to one. So it's exactly, uh, so it's, it's exactly the next four bytes, the next four bytes that are also in the same cache block. So that's why we see this uh, shorter latency of 100. And we see the same latency for the uh, next seven accesses. And right after that, 300. The latency is 300. So uh, this it give us, uh, this gives us the answer 
actually for at least for the cache block size in L2, which is uh, for eight memory accesses is 32 bytes. So in L1, we are using blocks of 32 bytes. What, happen, what happens in L2? Observe that access, memory access with I equal eight uh, has a latency of 300, so it's uh, hitting L2. And then we again have seven accesses to L1 because the latency is uh, 100. So this means that another L1 cache block is uh, being fetched from L2 to L1 with this uh, memory access, memory access number eight. That's why we have then seven hits. And then we have again an L1 miss and L2 hit. We are another L2 hit here, and here, again, we have a miss in access number 32, which is 128 bytes. And that's why we can infer that the uh, L2 cache size is 128 bytes. Is it clear? Okay. So then let's move to part B. In part B, uh, the question is, uh, we are using code two with uh, a stride one equal to stride two equal to 32. Uh, size one is 10, uh, 56, uh, you have one question? Part A. Uh, full, uh, so actually we, we, uh, yeah, we expect from you that you answer, uh, I mean, you explain, uh, briefly, uh, what this is about, you know, it's not just saying 32, 128. Yeah. Okay. Um. Yeah, and as I was saying, in part B, uh, size one is 1056, uh, size two is 1024. And uh, in this case, we observe that latency zero is equal to uh, 300 cycles. Keep in mind that latency zero is the value that we obtain in this array latency for the very first access in this second loop. So latency zero corresponds to I equals zero. Um, the, uh, so the question, the, the question continues, says, uh, uh, however, if size is equal 1024, latency zero is 100 cycles. And the question is, what is the maximum number of ways in L1? Okay, uh, we, we can assume that the replacement policy is uh, FIFO or uh, LRU for now. So um, we know that because we know the size of the cache, we know that there are 128 blocks in the cache, and we also know how we are accessing this array data, right? say that these are, this is our array. And with a stride and, and each of these uh, rectangles represents one block, one cache block. Uh, in the first uh, pass, in the first loop of code two, we are accessing with a stride 32. So this means that we read this element, this element, this element, and so on. And uh, the question says, if the size of the array is 1056, if we are accessing up to 1056 uh, elements or size two, uh, so, sorry, size one is equal, is equal uh, 1056, uh, we are going to obtain latency equal 300 cycles. Observe that here, this is 1024, 
observe that here we have 32 cache blocks. So the reason why we measure latency zero equal 300 cycles when size one is equal 1056 is because this last cache block is replacing cache block zero. Okay, so that's why uh, we miss in uh, L1, but we hit in L2. In case only, this part of the question, in case only uh, 32 cache blocks are accessed because size one is 10, uh, 24, this cache block is not being accessed, so it is not replacing cache block zero. So that's why we hit when we access element zero for the second time. So from this, we infer that the maximum number of ways is 32. Okay? Fine. If you don't have any questions, let's uh, discuss um, part C. So in part C, we again use code tube and we are also going to use code one after that. And with what we want to figure out is what is the replacement policy. We already know that the replacement policy is going to be FIFO or LRU because that's what the, um, uh, what the uh, part B told us. Uh, but we don't know exactly yet, so that's why we do we run this different experiment uh, where we first uh, run code two with um, a stride one equal thirty two, size one equal ten twenty four, stride two equal sixty four, and size two equal ten fifty six. So now, in our array data. This is zero. So in the first pass, in the first loop of code two, we are accessing this element, this, and so on. We call that we know the actually the uh, yeah the uh, question tells us that the associativity is the maximum obtained in the previous part, in part B, so we know that the associativity is 32, right? Uh, so as I, as I was saying, in the first loop of code two, we are accessing these elements. In the second loop of code two, now the stride is 64. So this means that we read here, and here, here, and so on. So um, observe that after running code two, we run code one again with a stride 32 and again with size 1024. And we observe that latency one is 100 cycles. Latency one is the latency of this memory access in code one. So if, if it's 100 cycles, this means that we find this cache block in L1. So even though this cache block was not accessed in the second loop of code two, it is still in the cache. So it has not been replaced. So that's why we know that this cannot be LRU because if it were LRU, it would have been replaced, and the replacement policy is FIFO. Is that okay? Okay. So if uh, A, B, and C was clear, if you understood uh, L, B, and C, then Part D uh, must be easy for you. 
uh, it says now we carry out two consecutive runs of code one for different values of size. Two consecutive runs. Uh, in the first run, a stride is equal to one. In the second run, a stride is equal to 16. We ignore the latency results for the first run and average the latency results of the second run. We obtain the following graph. Uh, what do the four parts shown uh, uh, with the arrows represent? Um, so keep in mind that in the first part, in the first uh, rung of the code, uh, caches are called and uh, we are going to warm them, That right? We, we are going to load uh, cache blocks in, in the um, uh, in the caches, and after that we run the same code for the second time, uh, so we are going to find uh, some uh, hits and misses, right? So some of the cache blocks will be in, the, in L1 or will be in L2, we might find them or not. So we will uh, see. Observe also that uh, the interesting part here is that we don't know exactly what's the size of the caches. Well, we know that L1 is 4 kilobyte because that the question is giving us this information, but uh, we don't know what's the size of the uh, cache, and you obviously don't have it here in the X label. So, but it, it's something, it's uh, clear. Here, latency in this part, first part, uh, before R01, the latency is 100. Between arrow 2 and arrow 3, the latency is uh, 300. And after arrow 4, the latency is 700. So it is clear. And also keep in mind that in this plot, in this graph, we are averaging the latency results of all the memory accesses. This means that all memory accesses here hit in L1. Here we find hits in L2. And here, misses in L2, and we should access main memory for all the memory accesses. So what happens uh, in this part, even though in all these experiments, in all this uh, flat part of the curve, uh, in all these experiments, we have latency equal 100. What happens is that the size of the array that we are accessing is uh, smaller or equal than the cache size, right, than L1. So you can be sure that this point here uh, that uh, R1 indicates is 4 kilobytes. So this would be a good way to know what's the size of, uh, of um, L1. That's exactly the same for uh, R3. This is the size of L2. So this experiment is uh, good to know what's the size of L2, right? Or to confirm what's the size of L2, if we already knew that. And uh, in these parts between um, R01 and R02 and between R03 and R04, what happens is that some cache blocks uh, hit. So, so we have hits for some cache blocks. We have misses for other cache blocks. Uh, that is also related to the replacement policy that we are using. And the larger the, larger the array, the more uh, cache misses that we have in L1 or in L2. Okay? So that's all if you don't have any questions. Okay. I guess it's clear. Um, so, so there is a sort of a story of the question, but uh, let me quickly summarize it for you. So, uh, so basically, um, here uh, in the question, we have an architect who is trying to build a specific machine for uh, high-frequency stock trading, right? And um, here are the two uh, processor designs that this architect is considering using in uh, in her system. And here's some more information about like what is known for, for these processors. But one thing that is unknown is the cache hierarchy or the memory subsystem. And this question is basically um, asking us to figure out what is the... Um, 
uh, the cache hierarchy based on some experimental data. And so basically this architect is running uh, this application shown with this code over here to figure out those details of the microarchitecture. So the program here is um, simple. It is basically doing random accesses uh, over parts of the memory. And um, there are two inputs to this program. One of them is the stride and one of them is the max address. So when you look at the code, um, we see that so, so there's an, sort of an infinite loop, like it loops for n times. Um, and um, so first, the address, this like variable is set to some random data and then multiplied with the stride and um, modulated by max address. So what this means is if you, for example, have stride to set one and then max address set to four, no matter what random data is generated here, the outcome will always be uh, like accesses to address zero, one, two, and three, okay, in any order, in random order. And then um, when the stride is two, for example, and max address is still four, then the program will only randomly access zero and two, right? So you can like figure out what will happen when you change the stride and max address in different ways. But at the end, like what happens with this application is you just like randomly access specific addresses in the memory. Okay, and yeah, as I said, the question is to figure out uh, like what is the, for example, um, the size of each level uh, in the cache hierarchy, what is the access latency to it, um, details like that. Okay, let me see if I missed anything here. I don't think so. Is the question clear? And, uh, and one, one more thing uh, that I have to, uh, I, 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 I will emphasize is that this application runs for a very long time. So here, assume n is something very big. So like the cache is warmed up and what you observe in the data that I will show next is that state, like when the cache is warm, warmed up completely. Okay. And um, here in this part, uh, we see um, some data obtained by running this application for for this processor over here. Um, and um, in the x-axis, we see the, how the max address uh, changes, and um, different lines here show different strides. So um, strides one, two, four, and eight overlap here on the same curve. And then here we have stride 16 and stride 32. Okay, so it is like um, difficult to read this at first, but um, if you like go through it carefully, um, it's not difficult to understand. So here, um, in this question, like one thing that you have to figure out to like quickly solve this question is like to, you, you have to basically understand, right? So you have to understand how caching works, how like, um, uh, how access happens and how um, like data is brought from the main memory to different levels of the cache and how they interact with uh, the subsystem, right? So for example, when you have a cache head, you will have some like lower latency compared to a cache miss. And this will change depending on how far in the hierarchy you go through the misses, right? So let's say if you have three levels of cache, if you miss in all of them, you will have the largest latency when you go to the main memory. Okay, so and here in the table are the parameters that we have to fill in. Uh, so there are some stuff that we cannot determine and some stuff that is not applicable. So you have to fill this table um, accordingly. So if it's not applicable, you have to write down that. If it's like not, um, if it's not possible to, to, to determine based on this data, you can just uh, put X or like indicate that. Um, okay, so let's start with reading this um, this plot a little bit more. Uh, so here we see like some interesting points, right? So until this point over here, the latency is constant. It is 20 nanoseconds, right? After this point, it starts increasing for strides of one, two, four, and eight. So this is actually showing us uh, the size of the um, first level of cache, right, for, 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 uh, of the L1 cache. So when the stride is one, you, you basically can access every 
cache block in, in the max address region, right? So you have that ability to touch every single cache line because you are just randomly selecting the address. So um, this strider one is interesting to look at here. Basically, until we reach this point, um, after running the program long enough, we cache all the data successfully and only access L1 cache. We always have a hit, right? But once we get to 32 bytes, um, we start seeing cache misses, so the latency increases here when the stride is one. So this means that we are touching um, two times more cache lines than can fit in the L1 cache. Is this clear? Okay, so this, this question, in my opinion, is the easiest to solve, but requires a lot of thinking. So once you like understand that, it's, it's very easy to like make those observations and determine like what is the L1 size, what's its latency. But I hope at least the latency is very easy to find, right? So L1 latency is this, basically. The point where you, your like, region you are accessing is very, very small, so it all fits in the L1 cache. This is your uh, L1 latency. Is there a question? Okay, yeah. So basically, let's, let's put that in. So the latency is 20. And here, access latency from is defined as, so it's basically um, uh, latency that excludes other levels, right? So if, if, for example, you are filling in L2 access latency, you have to subtract L1 access latency from it. Okay, so this is like just that level, but not through the hierarchy. But for L1, it doesn't matter, it's just 20. And then uh, total cache size. So as I said, you can determine it based on those two points, right? So it has to be 16 bytes. Right? If it's small than 16 bytes, then the curve would have looked something like this, so you will have some uh, change in here. Um, or if it was larger, you can fit more data. Okay, um, and then cache associativity. So this is a bit more difficult. Um, so how, how, how you can tell this is by looking at the other strides. So um, one thing we see here is that when we increase um, stride to 16 and the max address to 2 to the 5th, which is like 32 bytes, right? So we have 16 bytes of stride, and we are accessing a total of 32 bytes of a region. So basically, we are accessing only two addresses in this case, right? Because we are accessing at 16-byte granularity. So in this case, what we see here is that for 16, we can have like both of those two cache lines in the cache. We can fit two, both of them, right? Uh, because the latency is just the L1 latency here, 20. Um, this basically means we have to have two ways in that cache in order to fit those two cache blocks, right? Otherwise, uh, otherwise um, since those two addresses will map to the same set because the size of the cache is 16 bytes, right? They will discard, discard each other when you access them, but that's not happening. So then the cache is looking something like this. You have two sets, and we don't know how many um, sorry, we have two ways, and we don't know how many sets we have. So the cache associativity is two. And for the cache line size, um, so this is a bit more difficult, but uh, it's not possible to determine based on this information, because um, like if you test it, you will find that even if you make those like two bytes each, and then you have four sets in total, it will work, it will generate exactly the same um, latencies if you simulate like with different strides and different uh, max addresses here. Okay, so um, basically this is not possible to determine given this information. Um, so another thing to observe from this plot is that um, there is no similar um, peaks here like going up in this plot, right? So if it was like, if there was another level of cache, we would have had a um, another um, like straight line over here until some point where we saturate this next level of cache and then it will um, again continue rising after filling up that cache, right? So basically 
seems like it just directly goes to um, like this latency over here without any um, such um, such behavior like in here we can tell that there is no another level of cache but we directly access the main memory after after we miss in L1 cache. Okay, so all those parts are not applicable basically. And the DRAM latency is 100 nanoseconds, right? Because the max point we get is this. So it's like 120 minus 20. And um, total size, we don't know what's the total size of DRAM. Um, so this is not applicable for DRAM, right? Um, there is no like something like cache associativity. And same for the cache line size, we don't know that, okay? So like those four things are the only stuff that we can um, say based on this plot. Yep. Um, so why don't we know, so why do we know that there's no L2 cache? Why can't it be like a really big cache? Um, sure. It could be a very big cache, yeah. But you also look at the cache, right? Okay, yeah. Yes, yes. But um, yeah, maybe maybe you'll be confused in the beginning by that. And but um, after seeing the second part, I think it makes it clear because in the second part we have. But there again, you can claim that you have another level of. Okay, yeah, I, th I think you are right. So, yeah, so you, you can say that maybe it's a very large cache. Okay, and then this is the second part. Um, so this is the other processor, and you see that here we have more uh, variation in this curve. So we, we have that um, like stair-like behavior here, right? So we come to this point, the latency starts increasing. I think this thing is shutting down. Are we over time? I'll just cancel it. Okay. Um, okay, so we have two of those um, like peaks over here, right? And um, this basically, like, from what we learned from the previous part, we can now tell that, oh, this processor must have two levels of cache, right? And then, basically, in the same way we found the size of the first level of cache, we just look at this point, like the point where the latency for stride one starts increasing, right? So that is basically um, the cache size. It's 32 bytes. And the latency is 10 in this case. Um, for associativity, we do the same, right? So uh, what we did last time was looking at um, the max address for for a stride that can still fit all of its data in the cache. So it is 2 to the 6th, which is 64 bytes, right? With um, 64 um, stride. And we see that it can still fit the cache line when it's accessing only one cache line, but once it access, starts accessing two cache line over here, at this point, the latency increases. So basically, we don't have any room for, um, so we don't have any associativity here because two cache lines cannot map to the same set. So this is how we tell that we have cache associativity of one. And the cache line size is, again, not possible to determine from here because of the same reasons. And for L2, it's basically the same that we do, but instead of looking at this part, we are looking at this part now. So straight, stride one starts increasing at this point, max size of two to the um, ninth, which is uh, 100 and, sorry, 512 uh, bytes. So this is the size of the next uh, level of cache. And the latencies, so the total latency here is 50, including the L1 cache, but it is asking us only the latency from the previous uh, level, so this is 40 nanoseconds, okay? And then we don't have anything else here. It is the DRAM, so we know that it is 100 nanoseconds. And um, yeah, we don't know its size. We don't know anything else here. For the associativity of the um, second level of cache, we can again do the same. We can look at this point over here where the um, for stride 256 and the area, sorry, the max address of 
1, uh, 1024, the latency is preserved, right? So this is the L2 latency in this case. So with this stride and this max range, we can fit four cache lines, meaning four of those cache lines can map to the same set. So for to, to be able to do that, we have to, uh, this cache has to um, have four uh, ways, okay? So the same thing I did here. And again, we don't know the cache line size of the system. So basically this was the second and last part. Any questions about this? So I think this is a bit difficult to understand. I will suggest you to like try to do it yourself again from scratch, although you see the solution now. I think that will help you like reason a bit because like reading this graph is not trivial. 